we often think of chastity as having to do only with our sexuality, but it's, it's not only or even primarily about sexuality. Chastity involves our orientation towards all of creation, which means both people and things. We need to receive those things and those people as gift. And a gift involves a giver, which means that we need to be receiving all of those things from God on His terms. Just as with poverty and obedience, we are all called to chastity, all Christians. It doesn't matter if you are married or single, if you are gay or straight, we're all called to chastity. There's a quote I'd like to share from Pope Francis that he wrote in Patris Corde. Being a father entails introducing children to life and reality, not holding them back, being overprotective or possessive, but rather making them capable of deciding for themselves, enjoying freedom and exploring new possibilities. Perhaps for this reason, Joseph is traditionally called a most chaste father. That title is not simply a sign of affection, but the summation of an attitude that is the opposite of possessiveness. Chastity is freedom from possessiveness in every sphere of one's life. Only when love is chaste is it truly love. So in this video, we're going to talk about all sorts of different kinds of chastity. We're going to talk about creational and sexual chastity, but we're also going to talk about intellectual, emotional, and spiritual chastity. first gift that the Lord gave us is creation. He gave it to us so that we could grow in relationship with Him. It's like the medium or the way that we work out our salvation. God gave Adam dominion, meaning he would steward his creation according to God's plan. This is creational chastity, to interact with creation as a gift according to God's purpose. When the fall happened, we all uh, developed a desire to dominate. We want to dominate nature for self-gratification and plunder it for our purposes, not God's purposes. Work was given to Adam to tend and till the garden before the fall as a means of growing a knowledge of himself and his Creator. So this continues to be the gift from after the fall in we are called to cultivate the gift of creation in order to bring us into relationship with God, with our own nature, and with our neighbor. And the garden gives us a glimpse of how to do this. Cultivation requires patience, a lot of patience. God created times and seasons, and, and if we accept how the Lord designed it, it will yield fruit. He designed it to be slow and to call forth our dependence on Him because only He can send the rain. Creation is supposed to draw our minds and hearts to God, rooting us, no pun intended, in a deeper relationship with Him. We hear in Psalm 19.1 that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth His handiwork. Nature reveals the character of God who provides, who is good, who is the source of life. And we are called into this relationship with God through work and patience in our daily lives. 
So creational chastity calls us not to exploit nature, but to guard and protect it as an avenue to relationship with God and our brother. People often talk of chastity about something that we do or we don't do with our bodies. And there's truth to that. But everything we do with our body is actually coming from our interior. It's coming from our minds, from our emotions, from our hearts. From our intellect. Yes. And so there's such a thing as intellectual chastity. Mm -hmm. Um, Our intellect and reason and imagination are like every other gift we're talking about today in the sense of it's given to us for God's purpose. It's given to us to lead us into relationship with the Lord, with our fellow man, and with our own self. Um, we see that like we're misusing this gift, we're having intellectual unchastity when we're using knowledge for domination, for control or the illusion of control, for power. Um, and we really have an example of this with the Pharisees. Like they have all of this knowledge, but it's not leading them closer to God. It's actually separating them from God. It's leading them into distance from their neighbor who they're supposed to be leading to God. It's just like sowing division within Israel because they're, they're using knowledge for an end that it's not intended to. They know a lot about God without knowing God. Yes, exactly. And we see this very much in how we're interacting with media today. Like, and not just media, but news. We're not using knowledge of current events and social media and all of these things to lead us into a thoughtful consideration and encounter and engagement with our neighbor, with, is this true or not? How should I be responding to this? Mm. And more importantly, what does this tell me about God and my neighbor and how should I be prayerfully interacting with this? Instead, it's sending us into these polarized camps where we can't be in the same room with somebody who disagrees with us. Um, And it's really leading us away from the true end of knowledge, which is communion. You know, when when we go online, we're seeing not people, we're seeing images, Mm -hmm. we're seeing avatars. Um, In other words, we're seeing an object. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And this is the definition of objectification, right? To see objects instead of people, because objects are to be used, people are to be encountered. Mm -hmm. And there, there are many ways that we objectify, I think, through technology. One is that I was talking with a, a monk friend of mine a couple months ago, and we were talking about this phenomenon where you might see some kind of article on social media and whatever the article is, it's like, it just enrages you of, oh man, this is such a wrong. This is a social injustice. Mm-hmm. People need to, to know about this. And so you share the article and in doing so, you feel like you've done something to, to solve this problem. It's like a catharsis and an ego building. Mm-hmm. Whereas you've really only taken the first steps to actually doing something about it. It's a sheer illusion that we think, oh, look, I've done this. I've responded. But actually, we aren't dispensed from the fact that we're called to actually respond concretely to our neighbor. Like Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, this is how we'll be judged at the end of the world. And we're walking around in this illusion of we've done this, but we haven't actually done anything. Not that there's no value in sharing something, but often that takes the place of actual action. Yes, absolutely. And so it's, are we, are we encountering the, the person here or are we using this thing mm-hmm. in order to make us feel a certain way? Mm-hmm. We need to start to ask ourselves, how are we using technology? <clears throat> are, we, are we using it to, to build up the kingdom, to put out this video, to, mm-hmm. you know, things like that? Um, are we using it for evangelization, for, for deepening relationship for mm-hmm. encountering people mm-hmm. or are we using it to get some kind of um some kind of selfish gain whether that be psychological or physical yeah. or whatever it is and what it comes down to ultimately is is our use of technology gathering or is it scattering mm-hmm. St. Saint, Saint Paul tells us that we're going to be held accountable for every word that comes out of our mouth which means every mm-hmm. word uh which is kind of terrifying to think about but the, the instantaneous kinds of communication, the, the kinds of communication that are sort of just like opening us up for unchastity because it's giving the message that, um, that other people have the right to access, mm-hmm. um, you know, the right of access to us at any time. The, those instantaneous communications also really foster this environment of, of idle chatter because you're just responding so quickly and and it's so um, flippantly that you don't have to be so selective 
in your conversation, like you do in person or like you do in writing a letter. Mm -hmm. And that, that selective communication, I think, leads to a more mindful communication that's really rooted in the reality of the present. The beautiful thing is that we don't have to come up with some new life hack to figure out how to be in the present. The fathers are giving this to us in what they call watchfulness, like keeping guard over our thoughts so that they're like our thoughts are temptations that the enemy's trying to use to like pull us out of the here and the now. Um, but as we learn to practice watchfulness over our thoughts, we learn to be present and to use our gifts in a way that leads us into communion with God. I feel everything intensely. I have strong emotions and I feel what others are feeling, or at least what I assume that they're feeling. Emotions are good and they are a part of what it means to be human, but they need to be integrated into the whole of our being by being placed by our will into the context of the truth. Emotions don't necessarily indicate the truth. The truth is what we know to be true by our faith. For example, I can't place my identity and my value in how I feel about myself or what I think others feel about me. I can only find my identity in what I know to be true, that I am good as a child of God. We are not to live our lives tossed about by the whim of every emotion, but by faith, hope, and love. To be oriented toward others as gifts emotionally is to not use others to feel good or even to serve others to feel good, but to seek love. And love is the giving of ourselves for the good of the other and the receiving of the gift of the other. Love might include positive feelings, which I can receive with gratitude, with open hands, without closing my hands on the gift. Or love may not include positive feelings, <laughs> but the truth is that it's still love. One of the ways we need to have that love is by praying for emotional chastity in our friendships. Um, something I experience uh, fairly frequently is that I meet someone whose beauty is just overwhelming. Um, and I just want, I want that person to know me completely and see me completely as soon as possible, as much as possible. Um, and I want likewise to, to see them and to know them. And what a great gift that is to meet someone who's like that. Um, and at its root, that desire to share everything is a good desire. It's, it's a sign of the life to come that we're really meant for. But we're fallen, um, and we haven't yet attained like the full redemption of our passions. Um, so there's disordered desires mixed into our good desires, and we need to discern through those. Am I living my life grasping onto the memory of an encounter that was emotionally rich? Uh, we can do this with memories from yesterday or memories from years ago. Um, I am so guilty. <laughs> um, am I giving my mental energy to the future? Am I giving it to fantasy even? Or am I spending every free moment seeking to satisfy my addiction to emotional highs, trying to figure out how to get my next kind of emotional stimulation? But true emotional chastity is in the present moment. In the present moment, I'm faced with this deep ache within me and the reality that it won't be satisfied in this life. In the present moment, I'm given the opportunity to expose my desire to Christ, the only one who can fulfill it, to acknowledge my weakness, my attachment to living in the memory, or in memories or in fantasy, and then even with tears to be able to cry out for help to the one who can save us. Another aspect of chastity involves our body and our sexuality, our being created male and female. Rightly ordered sexual chastity really began in the Garden of Eden with the creation of Adam and Eve. And before the fall, they were the icon of chaste love. And we really see that in Adam speaking to Eve when he says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. There's nothing about that where he's grasping for her. He's really, he's really seeing her, we're experiencing him see her 
and see how she was created, which the fathers tell us was of equal dignity to himself, to Adam. But unfortunately, they didn't stay there. The devil came and he sowed lies and deceit and really tried to, to mar this icon of God's love, uh, which we find in marriage through the fall. Thankfully, Jesus came and through the incarnation and the paschal mystery, we really are gaining access again through, through that death and resurrection to the grace that we need to be able to chastely love one another. And through the mystery of crowning or marriage, that's where man and woman gain this access to receive that grace to love one another rightly, especially through their bodies. And we see that in Ephesians 5, which is the epistle read in the mystery of crowning. We hear how the woman is called to come under the mission of her husband, um, which is a better meaning for that word submission, to come under the mission, which is to support his death for her uh, and to receive his death and to, and to receive his death for her family, um, not to be used or to be oppressed or to be abused. It's to receive rightly that gift. And at the same time, the man is called to, to die, to give himself for his wife and for his family as Christ died on the cross. Um, and through this union, um, we see this medicine of this death to self and this gift of self, which culminates in the sexual union. Um, and when that, that medicine heals the rupture that we find in marriage uh, and, and makes it again this icon on earth of God's love. As the woman is called to come under the mission of her husband, there are some men and women who are called to come under the mission of Christ alone, and that's called celibacy. We give up this greatest earthly gift as celibates, this use of our bodily sexuality, in order to be open and available and empty in order to receive God's heavenly gift, which we're all destined for, but which we as celibates begin to receive now. As the icon screen is this meeting place between heaven and earth within a church, celibates become this meeting point between heaven and earth within the faithful. We become this reference point for all the baptized, and we show in our bodies the fullness of what it means to live chastely and what it looks like in eternity for us to live chastely with creation, with other people, and also with ourselves. And we witness to this possibility and to the freedom which we find in rightly receiving the gift of our sexuality, but also offering it back to God. And this, this pours out healing in the whole world. And just as we can't misuse our own, we can't misuse creation, we also can't misuse or objectify other people um, or their bodies through pornography or sexual sin. But we also can't misuse our own bodies through masturbation. This is really grasping for a gift that hasn't been given. And when we do this, we become like Eve in the garden and our world becomes as small as the fruit that she clutched in her hand. The deepest place in which we live chastity is the heart. Um, the Song of Songs gives us this image, the bridegroom says of the bride, you are an enclosed garden, a fountain sealed. So this enclosed garden is supposed to be only for him. It's the place where the Trinity dwells within us. And so to guard this place is what we call spiritual chastity. Um, we have to steward and reverence this garden to cultivate it and to be watchful against intruders, against blight that might come, against foxes that would enter the vineyard and spoil it. Um, guard against the penetration of any voice that isn't the Father's. We also need to guard against comparing our gardens to somebody else's garden. And we think, oh, that one seems very lush or that one's mm -hmm. overgrown with weeds and vines and they're not tending to it at all. Well, we've just fallen into judgment and jealousy. Um, and so we really need to guard against that. And um, it just makes me think of how the Lord says to the prophet Samuel, man looks at these externals, mm -hmm. but God sees the heart. And we can't judge the others garden because we can't see anything except maybe the gate. We can't even judge our own garden. Um, we have to trust that the Lord is cultivating that and our cooperation is to bring it before him. Um, and a big way that we do this is through spiritual direction um, or confession. Like we bring to our spiritual father or our mother um, the things, like these are the things that are growing. Are these weeds that I need to tear up and reject? Are these um, seeds that like small plants that I need to tend is this what I need to nurture because the garden is the Lord's and he's the one who cultivates it he's the one who plants his word who weeds out the lies who waters it fertilizes it by our trials and our suffering to like purify that that dwelling place where he is and so when we go to our spiritual father and mother what we're doing is like choking out 
the enemy's ability to sow prideful delusions and things that would lead us out of communion with the Lord or leave, even lead us out of our garden. Um, so like we're coming so that in the light of Christ, what he's revealed through his church in scripture, um, within that light, we can look at the garden and figure out how to tend that appropriately. Yeah, and when you tend plants, what happens? They produce fruit. And so really this fruit that grows in our garden is a gift from the Lord and not out of a, a spirit of fear that we don't want to give that away prematurely, but out of reverence for mm -hmm. what God is cultivating in us. Um, we really need to, to protect and guard it. Because we veil what's sacred. Mm -hmm. Like it's guarding and acknowledging the intimacy of this. We don't put intimacy on display. It's yes. something that's intended yes. for the beloved. Um, and so we, there are so many different ways that something can invade the garden. Mm -hmm. There can be those outside voices. We see that so clearly in the Garden of Eden when Eve is dialoguing with the serpent. Well, if he's there or not, he shouldn't be there, but he's there. Well, she shouldn't be talking to him. So that's a voice coming from the outside. We can also wander off and try to leave our gardens and look for him elsewhere. Um, that's another way that we can not guard our gardens. I saw this very clearly once. I was watching two friends have a conversation and one was excitedly sharing something the Lord had just spoken to her heart and she's filled with joy and peace like he said this amazing thing to me and the other one immediately then interprets it and gives feedback which was appropriate um, but this was just entirely premature and I just saw this other friend completely mm -hmm. wilt she became confused she lost her joy she wasn't sure if that was the Lord anymore and so that's a, an example of how we need to cultivate something for a long time before we should share it and, and so some of the fruits you see if you're sharing too much or too early is like confusion, dis, um, anxiety, chaos. Mm -hmm. All of that is a sign that it was premature to share something. Like a, a barometer of whether we've been spiritually unchaste can be our lack of peace. Mm -hmm. um, like if I am not at peace, then I have probably left this garden where I'm supposed mm -hmm. to dwell with the Lord. And so we need to return there, whether it's by the Jesus prayer or just in the moment, returning to the like in faith to this acknowledgement of this is where you are. Yeah, and really nothing can rob us of our peace. If we're with the Lord in our garden, no matter what's falling apart around us, we should be deeply, mm -hmm. interiorly peaceful. Um, I remember just hearing from the Lord in prayer. He's speaking to me, today you will be with me in paradise. And he wasn't just quoting <laughs> scripture to me <laughs> of what he said to the thief. He was saying this directly to me. Mm -hmm. And I realized today I'm with him in paradise. Mm -hmm. Well, the kingdom of heaven is within me. And so today I'm having this encounter with the Lord in paradise already now. Um, and then later in Matthew 6, um, um, Jesus says not to, st to store up treasures in heaven um, where a thief cannot steal or moth destroy. So like that place of intimacy with the Lord, nobody, nobody can rob you of that place. Nobody can take away your peace. From the garden in which he planted man to the garden that he's planted within each of our hearts, Chastity is really this call to reclaim the love that the Father's already pouring out on each of us. We've walked through the garden of creation into this inner garden within each of us. And now we want to offer some questions that we can take to prayer to be able to look at some of those places and movements that we experience as, as you, you watch this video. Take note of those places. What did you experience? How was the Holy Spirit speaking to you? What challenged you? What made you maybe feel uncomfortable? Those are the seeds that the Father's already pouring out. Don't let them fall on rocky soil. Those are the places to open and allow him to come in and tend the garden that he's already planted and that he wants to prune. As we know from St. John's Gospel, the branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that will bear more fruit. And you may ask, why does that matter? What, what does any of this matter? Why do I need to be attentive? Who will even know? But those are all temptations. That's precisely what the devil wants you to think. Because every chaste yes that we offer to the Father becomes a place of healing and love that's poured out and it affects the whole world. One small piece of wood that was, that was placed in bitter water for the Israelites made it sweet. And every small cross, no matter, no matter how small, if it's born in love and joined to Jesus' cross, makes the world sweeter. And that's the witness that the world's thirsting for, more than any other words that we can say. <laughs>